moving on from that we're going to talk about this before i leave you this really really good interview with um asap bari on our well, our generation music ogm which i really follow online a lot i really like what they do um i follow them mostly so i can know which albums are coming up because there's so many lils and so many young rappers popping up all over the place it's hard to keep a, a touch and press of who's happening and who's popping all over the place and since no jumpers kind of fallen off in terms of interviewing the young up-and-coming rap stars and whatnot I feel like all of my attention is being kind of shifted towards OGM and their interviews. And of course, some people, they highlight on Instagram pages and they have this little post that they usually upload around Friday or whenever albums release, where they kind of put all the list of albums and projects dropping and also singles. So you can basically go down the entire thing and check them out. They may even have a Spotify, I'm not too sure, that kind of collates it all together, but it's a really good way to kind of keep on top of the new music happening. So if you're kind of a little bit like me and a little bit all over the place, so you don't really know what's going on, but you want to also be, plugged in and in tune to find out who the next yeet is i definitely recommend you check out our generation music but they sat down with asap bari who is one of the founding members of asap mob of course with asap rocky and ferg and obviously rip asap yams and somebody who was really influential in kind of you know pushing forward this high fashion loving that people in hip-hop seems to have nowadays and um yeah his story is really interesting but i'm not gonna lie that's a really good interview one hour and 30 minutes of it i feel like it's maybe hakeem's best interview also i feel like you know it, it's you can tell the difference with somebody when they're interviewing someone they clearly admire or look up to or are fans of because the, the conversation felt like it was really flowing naturally nothing felt forced but it also felt like he did his homework and research and got the questions that need to be asked that you know the fans and people like myself and the kind of viewers on the outside were interested in kind of finding out um it would have been nice to maybe hear some of the other bits and pieces considering you know the drama around him and rocky maybe maybe some bits and pieces about why him and tremaine fell out because i thought they had a pretty cool and dope friendship going on then it's quite sad to see them fall out maybe what's happened with ian connor so far but apart from that i thought it was a really cool insight to kind of find out more about bari one thing i was really interested to find out about him was his story regarding tiana taylor and how influential she was with everything um in terms of the kind of origins of asap mob in that she kind of was the link between a lot of people because you know they kind of knew each other from the same scene in harlem and it's funny because when i think back to my time growing up on the internet i was also very aware of who tiana taylor was from where well, i am here in london from her just being the kind of it girl type of vibe socialite popular person online in my space so back in the day on my face, I remember even I remember even speaking to her, I think a couple of times on DMs and stuff about music and stuff she was dropping, or just about being cool and clothes and whatnot, because there wasn't a lot of people out there that were really plugged in in the way that kind of we were back then. So it was really cool to kind of hear him speak about that. Um one other thing I think it was funny hearing him talk about, oh, which I kind of resonated with, I think um Haki mugs me about Pharrell. No, I think about Lil Wayne, about if he ever got like a style inspiration from him and stuff. And he kind of smirked and said, nah, because he was obviously looking at us. And, you know, we were kind of looking at the OGs, at the, you know, Hiroshis and Nigos and whatnot. And it was the same for me coming up. There was a time when I was coming up, um, when I was kind of obsessed with Bape, um, when I was obsessed with all those Japanese brands like Fragment and whatnot, and Vizvim and stuff, when at the same time, Pharrell was also kind of having a relationship with Nigo and kind of launching being a boys club and doing his thing there. And he was kind of getting into that sort of stuff. And it was funny because I was clearly into that stuff way before Pharrell even knew who Nigo was. But obviously, because he's the fucking big megastar and whatnot, it looks like when you're wearing the stuff to the regular normie person out there, it looks like you're copying Pharrell. When in fact, it felt like he was kind of copying our little scene that we were all kind of plugged in on. So if anything, a lot of us, I remember myself in particular, going out of our way to not wear whatever Pharrell had in terms of bape stuff because it would look like you're copying them so if you had a particular jacket a particular hood he was wearing you wouldn't pour it like I think of my green camo hoodie that I flipping loved you know when he started wearing it a lot I had to kind of ice mine out and kind of put it to the side I didn't want to be baiting it up too much and um, when he started wearing the shock too much he started to put that to the side you know what I mean all those little things happened so it was less so about looking at Pharrell and more so about looking at Nigo the guy actually behind the brand the one who was kind of instrumental in kind of launching and helping Pharrell kind of launch building their boys club and do all that cool stuff going forward so that's funny to hear him say that and then of course the more interesting part of it was definitely towards the end where he touches upon um the importance of, of virgil and what he kind of meant to him what he kind of meant to the culture of rural going forward and i thought it was a really touching you know obviously observations from him being such a close friend to virgil and i think it's a really i i'm you know 
as much as it's sad that he's passed and of course the way he did pass and considering how much more he had to do and how much more how much he did in such a short space of time and the amount of people he's kind of left behind kind of reeling and upset that they maybe didn't spend enough time with him during the last times or the last months that he was kind of alive to kind of really kind of let him know how he much he impacted them and whatnot and blah 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 one of the things that's really kind of comforting about his time is that he clearly touched people like in a really deep way like because i you know i've been around the scene i've been around a lot of these people i've been around a lot of these people that know these people and stuff and i know how a lot of those people are they're really selfish really callous they're really self-absorbed um they don't really you know every relationship is kind of dependent on what you could do for them uh, that kind of vibe so for them to really kind of pour the love out there and let it be known that no virgil was special he was one of a kind it lets you know that that guy really was special and one of a kind behind the scenes because these people don't be giving out flowers too often they don't be giving out loves and props like that they don't be kind of kissing the ring or you know sal or kind of bowing to greatness and whatnot or really giving it up in that way because everybody kind of feels like they're the star themselves right they're the kind of star of their they're the kind of hero in their own movie everyone's kind of got these kind of delusions of grandeur myself included of where they should be what they should be doing so there's a lot a lot of kind of praise and um congratulatory praise and just reverence going around so the fact that they do this is clearly an i clearly an example of how much of how great of a guy that dude was and also what i like about it is that the level that he was operating at being the head of louis vuitton men's running off white uh, collaborations coming out of his ass super successful super clouded up you know viral all this sort of stuff that everybody loves and wants has a respect of the industry had a respect of people on the scene underground overground doing all that good stuff plugged in it was cool and it's i think it's great that he set such an example of being such so cool and so approachable and willing to like sign people's stuff and answer dms and leave comments and double tap comments and stuff and just engage and kind of bring himself down to the level of the regular customer and the regular fan because a lot of those guys are really up their own ass and kind of think their shit don't stink and they're always talking about you know uh paying dues and kissing rings and you know this nonsense to kind of make themselves feel important even though they're nobodies and the fact that somebody like a Virgil, who is a clearly a somebody in the highest sense of the word, was able to be so humane and so approachable, so open, whatever, definitely goes to, goes a long way for him. And definitely, I felt like sets an example where some people who are working as a middle management at some sneaker brand can't start flexing if the person actually designed the shoes that got you the job in the first place was so cool and chill and approachable you can't then be a prick and be up here on ass. so i definitely feel like that's a good thing that you kind of left behind but anyway enough of me rambling this is asap bari talking about you know the impact virgil had on his life and whatnot verge man verge is one of like he i feel like he was an angel sent from heaven like you feel me mm -hmm. like verge was like you see how tupac what, what age did Tupac die? 20 something, right? It had to be 20 something. Well, like 23 or some shit like that, or 26. Let's see. Look, how old was Tupac? 25. 25, bro. Mm -hmm. Tupac is a legend at 25. Virgil died at what age? 30 something, right? Imagine the shit that Virgil would have did if he was alive right now. I know, bro. It's, okay, it's, it's actually like so that lets you know that angels are real. Virgil is an angel. He got Virgil was killing shit. I met with this. I'm not gonna say nobody's name. I met with this um, a designer. He designs furniture, and I asked him. Why didn't he work with Virgil? And he said that Virgil was doing too many collaborations. And that at the time, he didn't see that Virgil was sick. And I, it doesn't matter about that. It doesn't matter if this person, Virgil was going Marikami. Next thing, fucking- Nike, um, the hardest Fucking Moet. Like, Fuck the, the, the just designing sneakers. Like, he was going Gagosian paintings. Like, you feel me? Mercedes like, Virg was moving like fucking 
flash on these niggas to the point where they couldn't catch up. He's and it was laps, just like, yeah. it's, that's the life Pac was living. Pac was living like, yo, we got to get this shit done. You feel me? What do you, so what do you feel like se- separated him from everyone else? His childhood. Of just, see, of just seeing things, being around Kanye, having the inspiration of fucking Pharrell and Nigo and Verge knew shit that I knew. Mm. This shit to this day that I'm heartbroken because I don't have nobody to talk to. Verge is the only, I could post these glasses and they could be fucking from 1876. And when I post them, I could post a, this part of it, the end part of it, mm-hmm. and Verge will know what the fuck I was posting. You feel me? Yeah. It's just like, V is the vision. You feel me? That's the God. Like, you feel me? And he knew, I knew, and we both knew, and that's why our connection was like this. You feel yeah. me? Virgil had, he had plenty of friends. But he know when he got into Louis, his little brother that told him to stop fucking with Ben Trill and get on some whole other shit, and that shit, if I didn't tell V to stop fucking with Ben Trill, he would have still been working with Ben Trill and it would have never been no off-white. Mm. You feel well, me? Pyrex before, right, too? Yeah, well, Pyrex before, yeah. It's just like, V was like, you know, he listened to me and I love him for that, bro. Yeah. That's he, seemed my, to very, he seemed to have very valued bro, everything you said. that nigga loved me and I loved him. You feel me? Yeah. That man bought me inside the Louis Vuitton office was like, yo, Help me on this show. Like, you feel me? Set up the mood boards. Like, that shit, I, like, that shit touched me. I cried. Like, you feel me? Like, imagine you a kid from Harlem not having shit. Like, having shit but not having shit. Then you in the fucking Louis Vuitton office. Like, you feel me? Like, that shit changed a nigga. For real, bro. Yeah. That nigga changed me, opened me. Like, you feel me? Mm-hmm. Like. Like, talking to Verge was like going to school. You feel me? Amazing. Amazing, amazing, amazing tribute there from Barry. You know, it's interesting what he said about, um, what he said about Ben Trill. It's funny because looking back on it, or even during the time, actually, there was a lot of bad sentiment around Ben Trill overall, wasn't there? It, it didn't necessarily do the best for the collective, representa- the collective rep- rep- reputation of the likes of Aaron Preston, um, Matthew Williams, Virgil, Jown, Justin Saunders, you know, loosely attached. It kind of did more harm than good, really. But I felt like it was a fun platform when I remember looking at it. I remember having the first hat that he put out with 40 ounce van with the hashtags on the front. That was pretty funny. I thought it was a pretty cool idea to have this weird kind of quasi collective boy band of designers dropping limited edition t-shirts and throwing parties and DJing. They were basically doing what kind of music we're doing, but in a way more cool and interesting way, right? Like loads of these kind of guys surrounded around the mixing. So surrounded around the mixer, fiddling knobs and fucking around playing horrible hip hop music and whatnot at clubs. Like it was really funny to see that happening in real time. And like I said, it was a real, I thought good you know platform to launch each of their respective careers but i think professionally maybe in the scene and the culture because everybody knew the powers of those guys individually right look what they've all gone to gone on to do heron's got his own brand i think he's debuting at new york fashion week you know matthew williams is smashing it at juvon she's got his own brand the leaks uh, obviously had his own brand off white and was heading up louis vuitton I think everyone around them knew what powers they each had individually. Like, you know what? You guys can be doing way more with your talents and, you know, printing these crappy T-shirts and throwing these parties that no one cares about and that will really age really badly. And clearly it did. And if you look back at some of the pictures, they're maybe a little bit corny and lame seeing these kind of, you know, these grown-ups surrounded around the back of the booth, like pretending that they're in a boy band and stuff because they're DJing and printing T-shirts. But I don't know. I have to be real, I kind of enjoyed it. I thought it was pretty cool at the time, but clearly their friends and family did not like it in the slightest. And then I thought also the end bit was also cool, where he touches upon the v loan controversy i'm glad i'm glad akeem managed to get that question because that's one thing i was wondering so if you're not familiar towards maybe recently actually maybe a few months ago news came out via leaks and dms and whatnot the i think maybe around time when bari was going through his drama with maybe tremaine or whatever something i don't know somewhere it happened um news got out there that bari doesn't actually own vloan i think 
like Ian Connor was throwing some jabs also because he's you no, know, he's got his ownership of Sicko and they've clearly got some long standing beef going on. But it basically got revealed that Barry doesn't own doesn't doesn't own Flown and somehow whoever business partner he got in business with finagled him in a situation where he essentially works for the brand and that guy kind of claims all the profits or something. And I don't know, something happened in business that basically revealed that he doesn't own it. It was a real big eye opener because, you know, we only know of Lone because of Bari. We see him, you know, posting drop locations of himself at random places in America where he's doing random drops and pop up shops and essentially slinging t shirts out from the back of his Maybach truck. So to hear that was kind of surprising. And he basically touches upon it here in this interview and explains what happened and kind of gives a bit of a warning to designers coming up and creatives to get their business in check before they you know, indulge themselves in the lifestyle as he kind of tells it. It's a really cool and insightful piece here. Um, yeah. And just a little bit back on V-Lone, right? There was like, what, like two months ago, there was this thing that came out that said like, oh, Bari's not a part of V-Lone mm -hmm, anymore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, what mm -hmm. happened with that? Um, with that being said, when you come into this business, have your business on point, and make sure you take care of your business before you take care of the lifestyle. You understand? So with that being said, is I had somebody who I trusted and they signed a signature without me being noticed. You understand? So this person made they self a part of the company without me being noticed. And when the brand blows up, somebody pops up like, hey, I'm a part of this, I need this. Mm. And you looking at this person like, where the fuck you come from? You understand? Mm. You're supposed person? to be my big homie. You're supposed to be da -da 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 -da. It was somebody that was my manager. Oh, wow. You know? Damn. It's somebody that I trusted that went behind my back and tried to do some funny shit and helped me with my Instagram you understand? And hacked my Instagram and now is trying to use my brand against me. Like, you feel know I me? Mean? That's crazy. This is so wild. So what's like, the so so what's the future of Vlone look like? The future of Vlone is us. It's us, mm -hmm. nigga. It's worldwide. You feel know I me? Mean? Fashion I'm working on my new fashion show, which should be coming up this spring. Mm -hmm. Um I'm working on a denim line. I'm working on a shoe line. Okay. Yes. Um, I'm working on a glasses line. And I'm just continuing, you understand? And with this, like, with me being as a designer, mm -hmm. I don't drop albums. I drop masterpieces. Yeah. So anything I do is going to be a masterpiece. You feel me? So with that being said, I've just been sitting back and just working on my product, man. That's it working on fashion shows, working on movies, working on, I'm going to be opening up five stores in Asia between Fire. Japan. For Endless? Uh, Vilon. Vilon, okay. So Japan, China, and Korea. And then those stores open, and then I'm going to come and open up some stores in America. Yeah. That's pretty wild, isn't it? Five stores across Asia. I guess what this list, what this kind of, shows or displays is that maybe his business is right over there in asia because if i'm not mistaken there is a business partnership or i think edison chen or something is involved in the background in terms of v loan i think that's why he speaks about edison chen very highly in this interview as well and how much he kind of you know how much he kind of um respects him as a person and a businessman and a man and whatnot and clearly they've got good business going on there and if anything you i remember correctly one of the reasons why vlon was successful or really popped off in a big way i remember seeing it everywhere was number one loads of kids you know wanting to wear it and feel like they're, they're from the hood but also loads of asian kids really resonate with the brand maybe because of the big v logo i'm not too sure maybe because they're obsessed with hip-hop culture also but for some reason v -Loan touched asia in a way that i've never seen any other streetwear brand do especially with somebody who is an Asian kind of founding it it's really interesting to see it um Asian people flipping love V-Loan they love the flipping V t-shirt they love that friend of foe t-shirt they love that denim jacket with the contrast stitching like they love V-Loan for real for real so it's pretty cool to see that going forward that he's doing it because I've always kind of had 
these kind of weird ideas in that way of kind of doing things the reverse so i remember one time when i was thinking about doing a fashion line i was thinking of starting off doing a diffusion line and then leading up to a main line but always having the main line kind of in the back of our mind so the diffusion line would always kind of inform the main line when the main line drops it'd be this kind of cool little story that you could tell and i think the same thing with what he's doing um with vlon and bari in terms of launching stores in asia as opposed to launching something in the states maybe launching something in Harlem, in New York, or going to Atlanta, or Houston, wherever it may be, it make more sense where he's from. But I said he's going the opposite way and kind of branching out. Instead of doing one domestic store, he's doing an international store first, and then kind of coming back to the UK, which is a really interesting way to kind of approach um, doing retail in that way. And if anything, if you think about it, if I would go and open a store, it would be somewhere like an Asia anyway, where I said it maybe like a Middle East, where maybe the retail sector is still somewhat valued, is still somewhat on this pedestal the experience around retail the activations the drops the cues all that malarkey adds to the law adds to the mystique adds to the desirability of the brand because that's essentially what kind of got it successful right the fact that they had these really cool limited drops that you had to kind of be in tune for and be around for to cop so that's pretty cool to see but i do like his advice there in terms of getting your business in order you know because Flown, v loan regardless of what happens in the future is intrinsically tied to bari like there's no one else that can basically take that forward and go with it so to have something that is basically your namesake something that is your baby that you've kind of nurtured from the beginning till now and then have it kind of be slipped away from your fingers because of bad business because you are too eager to cash in on the bag or you weren't reading enough stuff or you weren't reading contracts or you weren't paying attention or you didn't do due diligence is really horrible so and i feel like nowadays especially there is no excuse for it with the amount of free information out there available to kind of avoid these pitfalls and other past stories. So it's quite cool that he's being open with it at least and sharing what happened to him and basically saying, hey, make sure you get your business in check and make sure everything's okay before you get into business with these people because you could get finagled out of your brand. But I recommend you check it out. Really cool interview there. Asap Bari interview, Vlone, Asap Rocky Yams, Fashion Playboy, Carly Virgil and more. Definitely cool insights on there. So check it out if you haven't already. It's a really, really interesting interview. And it also also made me think randomly about the fashion show that he put together for Vlone that I felt like was a real missed opportunity to kind of progress the brand forward. Don't get me wrong, it probably, you know, the reason probably he didn't continue doing this stuff because I'm sure soon after this is when all the whole sexual misconduct allegations happened when he did whatever he did in that hotel room. So that may have maybe added to it and the fact that Nike dropped him. But I thought this show featuring Little Peep was definitely... Um, one of those shows that should have been the start of really cool interesting things going forward but if anything I feel like Vlone has kind of stagnated he hasn't necessarily progressed since this point when they showed the Vlone during Paris Fashion Week for spring 2018 I don't feel like it's really progressed anywhere forward past this event or past this moment so hopefully going forward I'm interested to see if he's able to kind of evolve the brand and take it forward a bit more because I think it has a lot of potential but you know, you've got to see that potential first going forward. But this show was a real big moment. You know, little peep kind of on the runway. We saw the Nike, the solos of cut and sew. We saw the debut of the denim suit, um, the flipping, the, the, the jacket and the pants. Um, we saw obviously cool installation or cool kind of runway installation art thing where you had, if I'm not mistaken, some sort of... Um, I think he had a Damien Hurst piece or something that he did in a Damien Hurst style. And for, for, for Mal to hide, for some reason this thing isn't loading. I don't know why. What's happening here? Is it crashing? Yeah, there you go. Anyway, cool. But you know what I mean. You can see the vibes here. You can see the vibes, all the pictures over there. But yeah, hopefully that happens going forward. And we'll see some more stuff from, from v -Learn. But yeah, it looks pretty cool, man. It looks pretty cool. Check out the interview if you haven't already. It's a really cool one there on our generation 